Okay. No, thank you so much. I think that was a very, um, a very good session with um, Susan Page. And uh, thank you for asking the right questions. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to um, uh, explore everything in as much depth as we wanted to. But the good thing is that um, we've made the connection. She's been able to share um, the State Department's perspective and listen to our concerns. And I'm sure that those are going to filter, fil filter off the channel. And we'd also be able to um, continue this discussion with her at another date. This morning we talked a lot about the um, development side, health, education, etc. But we also know that a lot of what we discussed is contingent upon a stable state and strong, responsive, and accountable leadership. Today, this afternoon, we're going to look a bit more at the um, peace building, politics, and security side. And we are very um, pleased to have a number of panelists. I'd like to single out um, Victor Elunga, um, not just because he's sitting right next to me, because he came all the way from the United Kingdom to participate and share his thoughts with us on effective leadership for peace building in the Congo. Thank you so much for coming all this way. Thank you. Um, we also have um, with us um, Monsieur Jacques, who is going to talk to us about the electoral process. Um, a lot of questions about elections and the democratic um, process were raised. And then our third speaker who we have is uh, Dr. Stefan Tubene, who will talk about good governance as an engine of economic growth. Um, I'm not sure if um, uh, George Zonga Zongola will, would be joining us at, at all, but I think in the, in the three present, we have a very capable panel, and I think it will cover the breadth of issues that we want to discuss. Once again, I'm going to appeal to them to um, speak for about 12 to 15 minutes to give enough time for your questions. So I'll start with um, Mr. Ilunga. Thank who you. will talk to us about um, effective leadership. And thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I have to say that um, I was sitting there listening to everyone and listening to all the questions, and I said to uh, the people who were next to me, I said, I think I have a very difficult afternoon uh, today <laughs> <laughs> because of the topic I'm covering. And I hope you can all understand me. I have a slightly different accent than uh, most of you here. So I've got small, uh, well, I don't know if I can call it small, but I have a presentation we're going to go through. It's a challenge in itself to talk about such a broad uh, subject, such as the leadership, in 10, 12 minutes. But I'm going to try my best. Right. Okay. Um, Thank you very much for having me this afternoon. Um, I'm trying to share with you uh, some thoughts on uh, what uh, we see as a leadership that would help uh, the DRC on its way to stability and development. <clears throat> okay. I just didn't see those things, but uh, bear with me. Uh, the main points are there. <laughs> uh, we're we're going to look at the concept and definition, current facts and figures, uh, new vision and materialization, um, then competence, ability, followed by character, and then we're going to draw some conclusion which I hope most of us will agree with. Uh, next one, please. Uh, okay, next. Right. What is a leadership? Leadership is simply a quality. Uh, and this quality has three main elements. One of them is the vision. Uh, this vision is basically a state of things to be, but this is in the future. It's not now. It's not in the present. It's a state of things that may happen or can happen in the future, can, can take place. And it must be materializable. Um, sorry if my accent is not, it's not that good, but it must be a, a, a vision that can be implemented, can be made real. That's, that's what it's meant by material, materializable. Um, also, 
when you have a vision, then it's got to be um, uh, the leadership or, or the, the person embodying uh, this leadership must have the ability to actually make that vision happen. So you have a vision, you have the ability to make it happen, and the third element is the character. And the character is basically, if you like, the soft skill, uh, the, the soft skill side of the, uh, the leadership. So the ability would be the hard skills. Next one, please. Now, if you uh, look at it that way, you could see uh, leadership as this stool with three legs. One of them is vision, the other one is the competence as well as the soft skill. Um, uh, this uh, this um, uh, 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 fishbowl, basically the stability of the fish, or put it this way, the life of the fish in this fishbowl depends on the stability of the stool. And if you lose one of these legs, that fish is in a big trouble, period. Um, so you can have the vision, great. If you don't have the competence, your stool is not stable. If you have the vision and you have the competence and you, you have very poor soft skills, as some of you who have been in management would know, the team or the people working to carry out this vision will not function properly and this stability here will be lost. Now, you, you would notice the floor there is a pretty wooden floor, but uh, some of us would, would have heard the expression that the world is a such a dangerous place, if not a very hard place. Now, that floor could actually be a stony ground. The jar has no chance, if it fell to that floor, it has no chance of remaining in one piece, so the fish in, is in serious, serious trouble. Please. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this uh, section because most of you here are familiar with uh, the current state of, of, um, of, of, of things in, in the Congo. But I've just highlighted main points here just to, uh, to establish what the current situation is because we are talking about the vision, which is things to come. So we must be, we must be having a present, which is... Uh, a, a completely different situation than what we're aiming for. So the DRC is, is actually labelled in some reports as the richest patch on Earth, uh, sorry, the richest, the richest patch of Earth on the planet. That is true. In, it's not me, it's some reports that said that. Estimated population, nearly 70 million. Uh, one of the least developed countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Again, those are reports, and ma many of us can actually uh, testify to that. Languages spoken, French, Lingala, Swahili, Chiruba, and Kikongo. That would explain why some of us have a very funny accent speaking English. <laughs> but there you are. <laughs> um, that, that's a Congolese speaking British. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, GDP, uh, this is 2009, uh, only about $11 billion. Uh, per capita is uh, 171 uh, US dollars for a whole year. So you can imagine somebody earning that kind of money to live on for 365 days. When you divide it by that, by the number of days in a year, you get less than half a dollar, basically, to live on. Uh, this is another disturbing uh, figure. You got the import is about 5.3 billion dollars and the export is only about 3.8. Now that equation is, um, is actually telling the figure. So it means that DRC is spending much more money than it's taking in. Now any economist will tell you what, what, where that will lead to. Quality of life, security, the DRC has one of the most vulnerable populations on earth. This is a report published by DFID. DFID is the equivalent of your USAID here in England. They published this uh, last Jan the January last year. And I believe it hasn't changed that much. In fact, since they published this report, you now have um, this war in, uh, in, in Equator, in Dongo, and so on. So the situation has actually gone worse, uh, you know, to my estimate. Life expectancy, 46 years. I'm 42 today. Well, uh, I will be 43 at the end of this year, so I've only got about three years 
to live according to that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, some, of, <laughs> some of us guys may be already living Allah all the time. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, okay. Average Congolese is, is defined as being very poor and lives on less than a dollar a day, as we've uh, shown by that figure. Now, the next, uh, next, uh, next, uh, next thing is division. We, we have described how things are at the moment, but what we need to do is project what we want that country to be, and that's the vision. So this is what we're going to go through. And it's all defined here. It, we want a stable and prosperous DRC. That's a fact. Everyone is saying it. Well, I'm not going to be the last one to say it, but please allow me to join the bandwagon. So that, that's, that's the vision we want, and that's what, that's what we want to implement. Now, the question is, how are we going to make this happen? That is part of the leadership. So now we have the vision. Now the question is, do we have the skills, the hard skills, and the soft skills to make it happen? So we're going to explore a little bit what this vision, how we can actually make it happen uh, during the, the few uh, next slides. So the first part is stabilizing. Uh, stabilizing DRC, we're talking about peace and security. So build the, uh, the defense uh, and, and security uh, uh, cap capacity or capability of the country. Uh, consolidate the political institutions. Uh, consolidate the economy, because we know what would happen. I mean, you, you can have people um, uh, working on the defense and, and, and the, uh, the, the political institutions, but if the economy isn't working, then you're not really doing much. In fact, the only reason the politics exists is, is actually to manage the economy very well for the country. That's, that's really the aim of it. Um, we've got peaceful and constructive relations with neighboring countries. I've heard some people talk about uh, Rwanda and Uganda and say, well, you know, uh, we really shouldn't have anything to do with them. But the reality is we're never going to get them out of where they are and, you know, uh, tip them somewhere else. They will always be our neighbors. So we have to think about solutions that will include them so that we can all live in peace. That, that is a fact. We can't get away from that. Uh, construct, constructive relations with all our international friends and allies. Next slide. So this is what it translates to uh, in, in pictures. For those who can, uh, who can understand pictures more, we're talking about an army that is really a national uh, army that has the interest of DRC at heart, not private militias or, or, or any form of, uh, of what we've been hearing here uh, this morning as well as this afternoon. Um, we, we're going to need to implement measures to build a uh, regular national army, which I've, I've just talked about, recruitment programs uh, for youth service and so on, uh, for, for youth into national service, establish law and order structures, establish and build adequate, reliable law enforcement organizations. We're talking police and whatever other law enforcement uh, organizations that we're going to need. Because remember, the army is for this, the security and the defense of the country round its borders. But inside the country, you, you, you have to use the police and other uh, structures to maintain the law and, and, and so on. Five minutes. Okay, I, I'm not even half the way. <laughs> <laughs> political stability. Well, obviously, we have to, uh, to have um, uh, political stability. Otherwise, before long, you have people fighting, and then they'll go and buy arms and so on, and we're back to square one. So I'm going to have to skim through. Next, next slide, please. Prospering DRC. Now, this is a bit ambitious. You look at that and think, well, who does this guy think he is? But that, that's, that's my idea of what the economy should be. Um, and and uh, I, I mean, uh, over the last few weeks, I've been talking to my colleagues, uh, George and, uh, and Akita Inge, as well as others, regarding uh, what we, we would really like to do with that country. But in any country, in, in any country at all, you look at the economic system, you'll, have, you'll find that they have this structure here, where you've got a certain sectors, industry sectors, that are considered to be the leading sectors. If you look at Iceland, for instance, the leading sector is the banking or financial sector. Uh, in, 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 in the UK, we have manufacturing as well as the financial sector. Uh, and, and here in the US, I don't know, you probably know that 
better than I do. Uh, you know, you can. But then underneath that layer, you've got supportive or supporting layers. These are economic sectors that are actually uh, primarily supporting this. They are contributing to the top layer. Uh, and, and of course, I'm not saying they're not bringing in any money. They are, except that they're not as much of a priority at the country level as the top uh, part of the triangle. Then you go to the next layer, which is the maintenance layer. Here, we are talking about uh, service layers, such as healthcare and, and other uh, 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 industries. At the bottom there, you have preparation layer, what I have called preparation layer. Basically, this is the education. Now, how does this work? I, I don't know how you do it here in the, in the U.S., but I think you're doing exactly the same thing as we do in the U.K. When I went to uni many, many years ago, um, there was a particular uh, curriculum for engineering degree, which I did. Now, 10 years down the line, you look at the same course, the same uh, engineering course, you find that the curriculum has completely changed. Why? Because then it was important to have, you know, to know the hardware, for instance. Now it's far more important, well, it, it, it's important to know the hardware, but the software has taken actually over. You know, you have to know the software. Everybody doing electronics degree these days must be able to program. So th that, that is, you find that reflected in the education. Why? Because that is the need in this bit here. So the, the, at the preparation stage, they look at what the trend, what's happening in the, uh, 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 if you like, the employment market. What are the jobs that are being created? What are the needs here? And then the educational stage is actually readjusted to meet the need, the economic need of this particular part of the triangle. That's, and we must do this in Congo. To give you an example, back in the um, uh, 1980s, I was still in Congo, and I was still doing my electronics uh, course, and guess what? They were teaching us valves, electronics valves, if, if any of you would know what that is. But interestingly enough, nobody in the world, no company was making valves at the time because everyone had moved on to integrated circuits and, and transistors and so on. But here we were, they're teaching us valves which nobody is making. And, and many, many of many of Congolese here can actually testify to that. You go to school in Congo, they teach you very, very old things which nobody is using. Give a PC to a Congolese child today, they don't know what to do with it. Whereas that is what this economy here needs. So we must connect this to the rest of the uh, the sectors there. And this, this is what uh, 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 my colleague, the Kitenga, was, was talking about. Uh, next slide, please, quickly. We, we're just going to have to rush through this. Um, I've, I have already spoken about this. Um, again. Again. Right. Now, one of the things mentioned was the, uh, the routes, uh, was, sorry, the roads, road building. Now, the first thing you want to do is, in, in order to have an economy, you ha first you have to locate people. You have to know where people are. Because it's in connecting people that you're going to move things around, and people move around. That's what makes the economy. <coughs> so when you look at this map, you will see the distribution in the population, or in, in DRC. Well, all right, we know there's been a lot of move movement around here with all the, uh, the wars and some people are moving around. But if you consider that to be static, you've got about 10 million in Kinshasa. You've got about 1.7 million here in Bujimai, 1.5 in uh, Lubumbashi, and maybe 1.4 here million in Kananga. You've got 1 million in Kisangani and so on. And you've got this band here. So the easiest thing to do, the first thing I would, I would do, is, is link them up because that gives you one big single market that you can distribute things to. You can sell things to those people. So this will be the minimum possible requirement for road building in Congo. That is the starting point. If we don't do this, forget the rest. Next, please. Now, um, this shows you the, uh, the uh, if you like, the maritime uh, transport capability. You've got the, uh, the, the, the river Congo there. And this is what's being used. Now, can, can you just go back a bit? Uh, yeah, no, the back, yeah, okay. Optimize the, uh, the transport on that. And three, this part here, when we get to the agricultural map, you will see it. 
This is the second biggest rainforest in the world. It's the second biggest carbon sink for the planet. You destroy this, we're all in big trouble. So whatever road we're building, we must preserve the environment around here. So because of those three reasons, first, there's less population around here than the other part of uh, the RC. Second, there is a river Congo, which can be used more efficiently. And third, there is the rainforest. Because of those three reasons, um, it would be wise not to plan a massive, massive road building around here. Could we go to the next one, please? We go to the next one. Let's keep going. Now, this is the map I was talking about. You can see the, uh, the rainforest there. It, as I said, it's the second biggest in the world. Next one, please. Now, all those things we've spoken about, for the man and woman in the street, this is what they would see. They would see these jobs. You know, you remember the triangle? Yeah, th this is what it is, basically. They, for a man and woman in the street, they would see that. They would see that there, there are jobs in mining industry, there are jobs in agricultural industry, there are jobs in, in transport, and there are jobs in, in defense. Those are, that is the top tier of the triangle I was talking about. Then you have the supporting layer, all these industries. We're talking about transformation industries. You know, we've got minerals and so on. We can transform all those minerals into metal and whatever we need. George and I had had a long, long discussions about this, and we, we, we're pretty much in sync. Um, so that when we're building our road, we, we won't need to go and beg somebody to give us um, all the, uh, if you like, the, the, the metal to, to build a bridge and so on. The, um, the supporting layer continues that. But you've got maintenance uh, layer, which is basically the health, the, the, the health care service and all the other uh, services that uh, a, a country needs in order to function properly. This is the preparation layer. <coughs> Sorry. This is preparation layer. Education. Next one. Uh, competence. Um, we've got a long list here. The shopping list is long, but we've highlighted a few things here which are absolutely important. Anybody running anything will have to be able to adequately plan and execute. And that is part of the uh, uh, competence. Good organizational skills. Uh, you've got to be able to organize your work and as well as the team and, and what, what have you. Next one, please. Um, character. Now, again, the list here would be, the shopping list would be very long, but we've got few things here that are completely oh, uh, you know, indispensable. You cannot do without these. We've, we need integrity. We need a leadership that uh, is, is made of, of men and women who can actually say A and you trust them that they're going to do A because they said so. Uh, they've got good morals, got ethics. Uh, well, obviously, they're not going to steal uh, the public money for their own means and, and, and what have you. And, and um, uh, uh, of course, there, there's so many of, of them here. Um, this, this particular element is the one that, uh, if you like, governs um, uh, as as, as uh, my colleague who will be talking about the uh, the uh, good governance might might agree with me, without this element here, you get all kinds of mishaps that are happening in in the Congo. Without the, the the character bit, you can be brilliant, you can be a genius, but if your soft skills are not that good, one you may not have fairness, you may not have equity, you wouldn't be able to grant somebody what they deserve because your soft skills are extremely poor. And this is the element that actually makes any group to go from the present to the future, the projected future, and not killing each other on the way. Or when they get there, there's still one, one team that is working together. Next one, please. Uh, conclusion. That's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, so that's, that's the, the conclusion. We, we're just reinstating what a, a, a leadership is. But in the end, what we're saying is this, as, as part of the conclusion. It's good for us Congolese to sit here and ask for help uh, from international community. And it's good that the, the international community is listening, but at least somebody is listening now, but we want more than just listening, we, you know, it, it would help if actions can come as well. But in the end, it will have to be a leadership that can provide, uh, at the end of the, uh, the, uh, the, the vision implementation, we have a legacy 
that everybody is proud of. Because we're going to have to provide a leadership that the international community can look back on and say, yes, we're proud to have helped this leadership get on its feet. Look at what they've done with Congo. We're proud of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to everybody. Yeah. During the morning section, we heard about uh, many practical solutions that our colleagues have proposed for the development of our country. And uh, what can be mind is that all those practical solutions are good. And if implemented, Congo can be a very prosperous country. But who's going to implement those practical uh, solutions that have been brought about? And that's where uh, the issue of leadership and issue of democratic process come about. And my point today, I'm going to talk about uh, elections. And uh, during our session, many issues or many points have been already issued about the, ele the, the election process in Congo. So what I want to do now is maybe point out to what I believe to be practical solutions to bring about uh, good, transparent and fair elections in Congo. We all know the importance of elections, though it has been raised up that elections in Congo are not uh, usually what we should expect because of corruption, because of many other pro procedural things which uh, makes it to not be very transparent. But because we are already in a democratic process, which unfortunately is fainting, we should, or we are called to go to the 2011 elections. And that's why I call them the elections of hope, hoping that those elections will bring about a good leadership which will bring, which will govern our country through a good governance and through a democracy. And uh, I've suggested some prerequisites for good elections in Congo. And the first, the first prerequisite was the respect of the constitution. Uh, for the first four or five months, or three, we have heard that there were some kind of uh, uh, people trying to manipulate the constitution so that they can change things. We know that whenever there is a flawed interpretation of the constitution, it's usually to benefit the government, the current government, which is there. And at, as a result, it brings chaotic uh, electoral process and we should still bring us in a chaotic leadership that we are today <coughs> uh, deploying. That's why I propose that we sh the government should not tamper with the constitution now. The second one, it's a timely establishment of electoral calendar. Up to now, we don't have any clear calendar for the elections. The Under Secretary of State even told us that the municipal elections or the local elections which were uh, programmed for this year are postponed for 2012, so which is already a failure. So, and if today some things are trying to move up, it's because the international community have wrote a letter to the to the government to pressurize them to start. Uh, the electoral process. We know that according to our constitution, uh, Article 73, we should have presidential elect elections three months before the end of the mandate of the current uh, president. We want, we call for the enforcement of the respect of the constitution so that we can respect at least that uh, uh, timing. And in that, we, the third uh, Prerequisites was the reformation of the CEE, which is 
commission electoral independent or the commission, the independent electoral commission. Today, according to the constitution of the Congo, that commission should be dissolved right after the elections. But it's the one which is still working today, which means that it's working unconstitutionally. Two, the president of that commission has the rank of a minister, as Dr. Kitenge said it. It shows that he is responding to the government, which means that he's no longer independent like that. Three, we should note that even the vice president of that commission is also a minister in the current government. So that's why Congolese people suspect the fact that this current government cannot, if it will organize elections, those elections cannot be fair or transparent because the commission, the commission electoral independent is not independent as it is. So that's why we suggested that uh, our commission electoral independent be uh, formed following the model of other countries like the USA, whereby the member of the commission electoral independent uh, go through the parliament, even our constitution has that uh, provision, so that the parliament can hear them and uh, prove their independency, and then they can be okay, they can be confirmed by the president. Two, those people should have, the members should have a, a mandate, a clear mandate of three years, maybe three times renewable. The president of that commission, electoral independent, should not be nominated by the president of the country, but he should be elected by his peer members in the same, elect, in the electoral, uh, the, the election commission. And he will have, he can be called president, he can be called chairman, and he will have maybe a mandate of three years, two terms renewable. And the last one that I've proposed is that all the members of the commission electoral independent should denounce to any future political career. Because if they have the views, the ambition of become, of doing politics one day, they can, that can bring them to be a partial. The fourth uh, prerequisite was the freedom of speech and political activities. We know that many reports have shown that that freedom is really fainting slowly and slowly. We call for the respect of the constitution, we call for that freedom, and uh, I've proposed that the Monique has a radio in Congo, that that radio be used or be opened to the political parties so that they have their, uh, their opinion, their views can be known to the, to the public because today the public radios are all owned by the government. The government is not opening them to, uh, to the political parties. But the political parties has to do their job and to inform the population. The population. So that's why we believe that the radio of the Monique can help opening a window to political parties so that they can, uh, they can educate the population about their programs. Now, the sixth prerequisite was the security. Um, here we know that, as uh, I don't know if it's Alula or Adimanja who told it, who said it, Congo is not only a question of uh, bad governance, but Congo can become also a question of security for Congolese only, for Congolese, for the, the region, and even for the entire world. If the leadership in Congo continue to be the same five or ten years after this, we can see, okay, it can happen that we see uh, something which is not good for the world because we have minerals that can be used in, uh, in the manufacturing of 
strategic obstacle. Strategic minerals. So if you have a bad leadership, those minerals can fall into the arms of bad people, terrorists, and it can be harm for the entire world. So today I know politics is about interest or diplomacy is about interest, but we should see beyond our interest. Americans should be see beyond our their interest. The international community should should see beyond their interest and see what is good for the interest of everybody. And two, about the security in Congo for the elections, I propose that the Monique, the political parties and the government creates a, a sort of security community co committee to guarantee the security of political parties because today, as everybody said it, the army and the police is under the control of Kabila. So we cannot go on elections and believe that those elections will be fair if there is nothing which is done to secure the, uh, the opposition. I went to the founding of the opposition part, political parties, and this is where I come, about, uh, I come back to the issue of corruption. Today, elections in Congo, if we, you give a T-shirt to somebody, you're sure that he will vote for you. Or if you give him one dollar or two dollars, so the votes are being bought. bought. But why? It's because it's only the party which is governing which has the money. And all other political parties which have ideas, good ideas, don't have, don't have enough money to do, to carry out their activities. So I suggest that if really the international community want to help Congo to come out of the ghetto where it is now, they should found the political parties or they should pressurize the government to fund them, which I don't believe will be done. So maybe them can do that for us. Now, I have, I wanted to talk about the 2000 elections, which I call the endorsement of mediocrity, but we talked about it. Some believe that it was fair, but many reports that have come out shows that it was not really fair. The um, Carter Center, when coming from Congo, said that important procedural, procedural flaws that weakened the transparency of the process, which means that they found out that there were many procedural uh, uh, flaws, which shows that the elections were not transparent. Even some candidates, like Bemba, uh, Rubero, uh, Azarias, even before the election, they say that they think that we are heading, perhaps we are leading for a masquerade of a parody or a parody of elections, which means that many people did not believe that these elections will be fair and transparent. As a result, those elections brought about a leadership which is not competent and which is doing nothing for the interest for, for the interest of the Congolese people. So that's why we be we hope that the community international and the Congolese people can draw a lesson out of the 2006 elections and now prepare for good elections in 2011. And for them to prepare for it, well, Congolese people have to uh, vote wisely and they expect that their voice will be respected. But because people believe that the ballot cases were either replaced or were filled up with other votes that were not the votes that the people did. So now I came uh, with a, a, strat a, a solution for that. I said, okay, if we can make sure that the votes are count on the polling station and the results are given publicly, and if we can come up with a committee of diaspora and the international com uh, community, to find a system whereby those results can be sent directly, communicated directly to Kinshasa through the technology, maybe through email, through, through phones, and that will require
to have a good system of people who, are, who can start working now in order to prepare for the, those coming elections, just to make sure that the voices of people are respected and count. Because when the people know that their voices were respected, that's when they will be involved more in the political process of the country. And slowly by slowly, we can start seeing a change. But when they see that they are voted for X, but it's Y who, who, has, uh, who has been uh, proclaimed as winner, they start losing their, their interest in the political system and in, even in their way their country is governed. So, I know my time is winding up, but what I wanted to propose is that if the community international can pressure, can put, can pressurize our government to uh, have good elections, we know that the community international know how to organize good elections because they have been organizing good elections in other countries. So why can't they do the same in Congo? So the, the present that we are asking to the community international is to be sincere with the Congolese crisis and come up about with a good plan that they have been implement, implemented in other countries so that we can have transparent and good elections. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I hope the technical problem has been sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> this is the theme of our discussion uh, this afternoon. Uh, it was about uh, accountable leadership, and we were asked to talk about good governance. And among other goals of the, uh, our session, uh, we proposed the last one, and I think everybody will con concur with me that the sharing of the Congolese diaspora's willingness to engage, uh, actually the actual engagement uh, in the development of the Congo is much needed because uh, most often we get into academic discussions and after that we we disperse and we go on our ways and nothing is done. So um, I think somebody mentioned a few years ago we had discussion with the State Department at one point and uh, then suddenly die out. So um, I hope that uh, this uh, forum or this kind of forum will continue but lead to uh, tangible uh, actions rather than just uh, academic uh, exercise. My presentation has four parts. Yes. Uh, I will just briefly uh, discuss the, the concept of good governance and I will um, compare that good governance to what is going on uh, in the Congo, uh, which I call mismanagement or misapplication of the uh, concept. And I will provide some strategies that can be implemented in order to achieve uh, this good governance. And also uh, discuss briefly this building strategy is one of the uh, reasons why we're here. And finally, I will give some concluding remarks. Starting with uh, good governance concept, the definition, by definition, uh, governance is the exercise of authority. Uh, that could be in the political um, field, in economic, also administrative field, to manage a country's resources and affairs. When you talk about governance, there are some mechanisms, there are processes and also institutions through which citizens and groups of people can artic articulate their interests, uh, they can exercise their legal rights, uh, meet their obligations, 
and also do mediation among groups. Most recently, the U.S. Secretary of State was in the Congo. That was last year, in August of last year. And I quote, you have some of her remarks. She said, we know that the promise of DRC is limitless. We will help you build a strong civilian-led government that is accountable, transparent, and dependent judiciary, professional military that respects human rights, a free press, and an active and engaged citizenry, a society whose institutions respect the rule of law. That's a quite a statement. Uh, if an official from the government, the U.S. government, is able to um, recognize that we need all of this, it means that we don't have it now. Uh, that this is quite clear. And also, uh, the statement by Ms. Page, I think she alluded to um, those statements. And one of the statements also from the Secretary of the, of, 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 of the State, uh, she said, and I quote, I think that student leaders, and she was talking to students, uh, student leaders like yourselves are the ones who have to speak out for the progress that you seek speak out to end the corruption, the violence, and the conflict that have for too long eroded opportunities across the, this country. Together, you can write a new chapter of Congolese history, which is another truth. Uh, we know that from the past, students were very much engaged in changing um, uh, government government or uh, political regimes uh, in the Congo, uh, starting with Mobutu um, when in the 60s uh, he sent students to the army and um, all the strikes that used to go on uh, in the Congo uh, in the 60s and even in the 70s. The governance plan in the Congo is recognized in five strategies, and that from the uh, UNDP website, uh, actually they have committed themselves to uh, 390 million uh, investment for governance program by UNDP and on those five uh, strategic <coughs> government components uh, in the Congo, um, which the first one is on uh, political uh, situation in the Congo where they uh, have provided enough money through the uh, institutions and um, actually the, the parliament where they, they have to move through uh, a very uh, structured institutions in the Congo uh, when it comes to the parliament. The administrative commitment also is there, uh, economic uh, component, local, legal, and security issues. All of these in PRSP uh, uh, strategy by the World Bank uh, all combined to see this uh, happening. And that has those goals uh, to achieve uh, those five strategies. Uh, the first goal is to lay the groundwork for the, the emergence of a strong state capable of boosting national unity and reconciliation to ensure the security of its people and their prosperity to increase citizen access and uh, participation in the political system uh, and so on. So uh, as you can see those goals uh, in there. But let me just talk about a little bit about the evaluation of that program. Um, <clears throat> For those far away, you may not see uh, the graph to the left. That's the governance indicators. Uh, as you can see, there is high correlation between 
governance indicators and economic uh, development indicators. I will say even this is the, the poverty indicators uh, because uh, economic indicators, they show the progress that the country has made over the years. This is a report from UNDP in 2007 uh, actually corroborating some of the remarks by um, my colleagues that have been here before me. Um, Mr. Ilunga had to talk about it. And here, looking at a different uh, perspective, you see the HDI, that's the Human Development Index. Uh, Congo ranking 176 country, uh, countries over 182. So that's the uh, top bottom uh, in that ranking, and the, then you have uh, HPI, which is a uh, rank of poverty. So we are 120th country uh, out of 135. Uh, GDP, so you saw that uh, with uh, the other colleague, and life expectancy 48. Adult literacy in this country is about 99%, and uh, the Congo is only 67%. Uh, access to safe and drinking water, that shows the health component uh, of our people, only 46%. But when you look to the other side, the governance indicators, uh, let me read, it's shown in percentile. When your child comes from home and you say, oh, daddy, I score 75th in, in um, percentile, it means what? It means that she is 70, 75th above any other people, so which means that in the case of the Congo, the percentile for voice and accountability, we rank on the top 8%. This is really very, very uh, disturbing. Uh, uh, political stability uh, is about 2%, and that um, percentile, government effectiveness, that's almost no, it's, it's close to that line actually. Um, and then the rule of law and con control of corruption, you see that actually the figure is showing two years from 2007, 2008, and see the change. So they, they have not been uh, much change. Uh, what are the recommendations? Looks like my time is up. Uh, but let me very quickly um, see uh, what is going on there. Um, what I've said is that you know the Congo is a failed state, so we can go to the next one. Uh, I'm talking about the executive branch. Uh, what we need to do is to have commissions uh, in parliament, and commissions that have to have leadership uh, in true democratic elections, and we have to have a plan for peace in the Congo and in the Greater Lake regions, and that is not happening. We have to strengthen our judiciary we have to create a national program to support governance. Uh, that will be a structure that will coordinate all the activities involving uh, good governance. We need to promote accountability and also um, the transparency in the management of the country. Yes. Um, when it comes to peace building, uh, we have to go by two principles. One is, and everybody's talking about leadership, and again, it comes again. We have to see how we can get in place responsible, transformational leadership, and how we get there through democratic uh, elections, and like we saw uh, earlier. The uh, peace building strategi uh, strategies for the Congo, uh, I know we have had war in, in the East Congo, but like uh, in South Africa, they had uh, established truth and reconciliation commissions. I have not seen that happening in the Congo where people sit and talk about the problems and solve within, uh, the, in, in the community and also punish those that have been found uh, guilty of uh, any mis, uh, uh, you know, wrongdoing in the Congo. We have to uh, promote the, and protect human rights and we have to establish and promote uh, democratic institutions. Uh, in concluding, uh, for many years, Congo has been operating in culture of impunity, and again, we share that. We have to come up with mechanisms that will uh, advocate for accountability. Uh, we have to actually um, 
bring to justice those who have been found uh, guilty of any wrongdoing. And I will leave you with uh, a statement by, uh, yeah, just go, go to the last one. Um, go again, the last one. Yeah. Uh, this is a 16 years old girl that was asked to write about crisis in the Congo. And she discussed the refugee situation in the East Congo. And uh, by the way, she got 99% on her essay. And she's um, in fifth grade, uh, or not fifth grade, but it's uh, what? What do you call it? Uh, 11th, 11th grade. Um, and she said, although interference from international organizations in other countries is necessary. A national government must take responsibility for the welfare of the nation. The weak government of the Democratic Republic of Congo requires extensive reconstruction to protect its borders, protect its citizens, and permanently end the refugee crisis. Can you believe that? That's 16 years old. And not, ne never been to Congo, born here, raised here, researching on her, you know, assessors from Congo, and that's what she found. And that girl, 16 years old is what it happens to be my daughter. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we welcome our fourth um, panelist, um, Dr. George Zangola, um, who will be um, speaking to us briefly about um, peace, justice, and security. How much time do I have? Ten minutes, sir. Ten minutes. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Lula, for inviting me. Actually, I was invited yesterday, and uh, uh, I haven't uh, seen the programs. So I don't know what has gone on before. Uh, and uh, having been at this race for a long time, I went to the wrong address for the Institute, uh, where it used to be. <laughs> mm. wanted to find out it is moved to here, uh, so that's why I'm, I'm late. Um, but I'm not, what I'm going to do is basically to say things that you've already heard, so I'm basically reinforcing what uh, this distinguished panel has, uh, has said. Uh, in terms of talking about uh, peace, justice, and security, uh, the main question is what are the main threats to peace, justice, and security in the DRC today, and what should be done to restore them? This is a very simple question. And the main threats I've chosen basically three. The first is basically the conclusion that uh, our distinguished panelist here, uh, uh, child has said, 16 year old, uh, state failure. Uh, the Congo is a country of continental dimensions, uh, very, very huge. If it was uh, <coughs> superimposed on a map of Western Europe, goes all the way from uh, London to past Berlin. It's extremely large. And yet, we have been invaded, occupied, and looked at by states of Lilliputian size, like Rwanda and Uganda, who are smaller than the smallest of our districts, and Rwanda smaller than the smallest district in the Congo, and Uganda smallest than the smallest province in the Congo. Uh, and yet they're able to, to give us hard time. Why? Because we have no state to speak of. Uh, we have very weak state institutions. Uh, we have state uh, governed by people who don't care about the uh, security of the people. Uh, this was shown just uh, uh, recently when uh, Human Rights Watch uh, reported that uh, the laws, this was army, uh, this group of uh, uh, child soldiers, uh, drunk and him, uh, you know, went into a village and killed over 350 people. The government of DRC responded Human Rights Watch was wrong, was exaggerating. But from their account, only 25 people were killed. So for the government of the Congo, 25 people isn't nothing, you know. Uh, so when, when the responsible states like the government of Israel, the government of, of U.S., would pursue the killer of one of their citizens, for us, 25 is nothing. We don't have to worry about the Human Rights Watch is exaggerating. That so shows you the, the level of, of, of commitment. Uh, Mr. Ilunga talked about uh, ethics and uh, morals. Uh, it's a government of no morals, governments of no ethical commitment, to the, to the uh, standards of governance as we, as we understand them. Um, so the state decay and the pervasive weakness of state institutions explain the situation why we have no peace, we have no justice, and we have no security. The security forces cannot protect the public. Uh, we again, the losses army went to the, the city of Faraje in Oriental Province on Christmas Day, 
2008, butchered men, women, and children. There was no Congolese army to be found, no Congolese police force to be found. Uh, and the question is, what are we doing then? Uh, what do we have in this institution? We have a huge, huge army, plethoric, who lost the soldiers. Uh, we have a huge police force, and yet uh, a small group of child soldiers can enter a, a town and butcher people, and we don't, we don't see these, these people. Um, economic management agencies uh, are riven by corruption and incompetence. They are unable to mobilize revenue for the state. Uh, one group of experts estimated that our customs collect in a year one-tenth what they're supposed to collect. Uh, certainly they collect a lot more than one-tenth, <laughs> but uh, the money disappears and it goes into, into their pockets, it goes into the pockets of officials rather than going to, uh, to, to uh, the state treasury. Uh, we have a situation where we are a great producer of electricity through the Inga Dam. We provide electricity to Zambia and Zimbabwe and to our neighbors to the north, Santa African Republic, to the west, Congo, Brazil, and others. We can provide electricity to the city of Kinshasa, <laughs> right in the capital city. And, of course, we can provide electricity to all the other cities on the, the Inga Shaba line, which goes from, uh, from the Inga Dam to Kolwezi. So again, uh, showing uh, the incompetence of, and of course the lack of, of uh, planning and lack of uh, foresight on part of our rulers. Our state agencies are unable to deliver services to citizens in a timely and equitable uh, manner. Uh, we all know the, the um, matter concerning passports. Uh, today, uh, many Congolese can travel. We don't have no passports. And, and some have traveled from Japan, and Canada, and Russia to go to Kinshasa to get the passport. I had to spend $400 to get one within two days. And I was in Kinshasa, end of June and beginning of July. I said, I'm leaving on July 3rd, so I got to get this passport. They said, well, you know, just give us the money, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of everything. <laughs> so anyway, I managed to get one. Uh, so we have, we're looking at the failed state. <laughs> <laughs> no, this I just service because I was told that I had to provide a certificate of nationality. I said, but I had one when I was a member of the Electoral Commission, 96. I had the certificate of nationality. They said, well, we have to go to, to Casier Judiciaire, we have to go to the security police, we have to find out about your criminal record. This is the, these are the bureaucrats <laughs> before me telling me. They said, we, go, we need the money to find this information. So I gave this money to bureaucrats in the foreign yeah. ministry because they said they needed it to find the information they needed to give me a passport. Anyway, uh, so we have a state uh, whose rulers have lost all legitimacy uh, and rely on force, corruption, and foreign support in order to cling to power. Today, President Kabila is attempting to change the constitution so he can stand forever. Uh, and of course, there are people who are willing to help him do this because they too benefit uh, from the system as it is. The second factor of the uh, lack of uh, peace, uh, justice, and security is, of course, the resource war in Eastern Congo. Uh, this, we have had a creeping occupation and creeping balkanization of the DRC since 1996. First with the FDL, which Laurent Kabila himself uh, aptly described as a conglomerate of adventurers, uh, which is uh, to say that this was a group of people who had no vision for the future of a country, no organization, were simply recruited by neighboring states who wanted an excuse, who wanted a justification for their uh, drive to remove Mobutu from power and found Kabila and put him in power. Uh, we've had uh, uh, Rwanda and Uganda got access to Congolese resources through this, this adventure. Then two years later, they invaded the country openly uh, to be able to control it. Uh, through proxies such as the RCD, the MLC, uh, and later on the CNDP, uh, which today is, is integrated into the Congolese army, and yet which you know from even the New York Times uh, cited the issue of December 4, uh, 2008, indicated the CNDP is filled up with Rwandan soldiers. Uh, so we have the use of the so-called FDLR, uh, the, the Hutu militia. Today we understand that Reverend Mulunda uh, is taking the FDLR to, to Katanga and to Lower Congo. To do what? Uh, why is the FDLR, which is supposed to be threatening Rwanda security, uh, and which is supposed to be disarmed as a security force, uh, being, being sent out of the Congo? Is that to provide Rwanda another justification to, to, to come all the way to Katanga and to Lower Congo, which they went to at Kitona in 1998, uh, to see that they have to destroy 
this so-called uh, genocide. Uh, but again, uh, we know that Umoja uh, Wetu, Amani Leo, all of these organizations, I mean, all of these operations were under the control of the, the CNDP, which is certainly a unit which is not trustworthy and which is led by a criminal wanted by the International Criminal Court. Uh, so we think that the, uh, there is uh, an external complicity when the President of the Congo makes agreements of, with a state that is basically threatening our security, and we are told that this is a, a very uh, statement-like behavior, is something for West Congolese that is tantamount to treason. It's nothing that is good for Congolese interests. Uh, we need to have a strong state. We need a state that is governed by patriotic and responsible Congolese who put the interest of the country ahead of everything else. So how do we restore peace, justice, and security in the DRC? First, I have to deal with the, the, uh, uh, the root causes of the armed conflict, injustice, and insecurity. We have to establish that authority throughout the national territory. Uh, we need the leaders who are really committed to this. We need the capacity of reinforcement of state institutions. This was already done here in terms of uh, what Ilunga said, in terms of a responsible Republican disciplined army. Uh, we need judicial reform is to, to uh, come to a situation where we have independent judiciary and not a judiciary that can be corrupt, that can be controlled by the government. Uh, and of course, we need to send Rwandan troops back home, which means to dismantle the CNDP uh, and make sure that uh, all the soldiers we have are citizens of the Congo rather than from different countries. Um, we need to mount a strong international campaign against the hypocrisy of world leaders uh, who tell us, for example, to forget the past and look to the future. Uh, the uh, Jean-Pierre Mbelu, one of our smartest priests, in one of his blogs asked Mrs. Clinton after his speech in Kinshasa in August of last year, he said, would Mrs. Clinton and the U.S. establishment would like to forget September 11 and look to the future? Uh, I think this is a, a very interesting question. Uh, when we, we ask for reparation from Belgium, they say no. But why should other countries say, say you know, get reparations? Uh, for crimes committed against them, while well, we shouldn't be able to, to ask for reparations. Uh, and uh, so we need to, to mount a, a very strong campaign to talk about the silence in the Russian community, about the heinous crimes being committed in the Congo, uh, and what the Catholic bishops of the Congo called in a statement in 2008 as the silent genocide against the Congolese people. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, excellent presentations on aspects of peace building, governance, leadership, justice, and security. And um, we have about uh, 20, 25 minutes for questions. And uh, again, I'll start on this side. And uh, again, at a appeal for brevity, um, please be very, very, very brief. We'll take four on this side, the four hands I see up, and then we'll move to this side. We'll start with you. Beaucoup de mes préoccupations ont été. Most of my concerns. Ont été. Ont trouvé solution dans l'exposé du professeur Zongola. Merci beaucoup. Euh, euh, je m'adresse à M. Yunga. Euh, C'est vrai, le, la durée de vie au Congo est de 46 ans. Aujourd'hui, j'ai 62 ans et vous avez l'âge de mon second fils. Qui va fêter ses 44 ans le lundi prochain. <rire> Yes, today, life expectation in Congo is 46, and you are 42, or going 43. This is the same age like my, son, my, first son, my second son, who is turning 44 next week. Ça me fait mal, je m'excuse beaucoup, mais ça me fait mal de vous attendre dire qu'on ne devait pas parler du Rwanda et de l'Ouganda. It hurt me to... To hear you saying that we don't have to speak about uh, Uganda and Rwanda. Le Congo a neuf pays voisins. The Congo has nine neighbors. Et la même situation se retrouve entre le, 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 le Congo et l'autre pays. C'est-à-dire on trouve 
les mêmes tribus euh, au Congo et dans le pays voisin. And the same situation repeats itself on with all those men in Nebo because we found tribes uh, across the border on uh, all those countries. Pourquoi n'avons-nous pas de problème avec tous les autres pays voisins, sauf avec le Rwanda? Why don't Je peux vous confirmer que le sénateur Lunda Bululu a des voisins euh, zambiens. Et il est sénateur au Congo, il n'y a pas de problème. Je peux vous confirmer uh, que uh, le sénateur Linda Bouloulou a des neighbors de Zambie. Il a des cousins. Il a des cousins. Il a des cousins en Zambie, mais il est encore sénateur au Congo. Alors, pendant longtemps, nous avons vécu avec le Rwanda en paix. Pour longtemps, nous vivons avec le Rwanda en paix. Je voudrais vraiment appeler pour une question. Nous n'avons pas beaucoup de temps. La question est celle-ci. Quand vous nous dites de ne pas parler du Rwanda, yeah, quelle est la responsabilité du Congo dans ce qui est arrivé au Rwanda Qu'est-ce que le Congo a mal fait au Rwanda pour ce que nous subissons aujourd'hui Et euh, c'est ça, mais qui attaque qui et qui fait du mal à qui What is our responsibility for what's going on in Rwanda? Concernant l'économie, là je crois aussi qu'il y a quelque chose qui ne va pas parce que 80% de l'économie congolaise est hors norme dans l'informel. About the economy, 80% of the Congolese economy is on informal sector. Ce n'est pas les diplômes qui manquent au Congo, c'est l'utilité qu'on en fait. The diploma, it's not the degree or diploma that are missing in the Congo, but what you do with your education. Qu'est-ce que vous nous proposez concrètement pour cela? What What are your suggestions, concrete sir? Pour améliorer l'économie du Congo, pour trouver, créer de l'emploi pour ces jeunes diplômés. To improve the Congo's economy and help those young people to find work. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the gentleman here. Please be very brief, otherwise these will be the only four questions we have to end at 3.30. Yeah, uh, thanks. I'm addressing my question to Professor Zongola. Uh, thank you very much for your very impressive uh, presentation. I'm sorry we're not there this uh, afternoon around 12. You have a good question for the Deputy uh, Secretary working from the State Department. To have summarized what, as I said. But my question is this. Uh, you mentioned the, the aspect of uh, security and pointing out the military problem in the government. Uh, and you say that we should remove those uh, soldiers who are not Congolese and remain with Congolese soldiers. Perfect. I'm 100% with you. But how do you intend to do this in a situation that is in Congo where even the minister himself, the foreign minister, I think, uh, say that we have non-generals from outside, the infiltration in army. How do you remove this? How do you intend to do this if the leadership is very poor and doesn't respond to its, uh, to its, uh, its duty? Thanks. I'm going to be sure to leave. The gentleman in the... Right. Um... My question, I think it's going to be just a comment. If we, and that will be in regard to what um, Mr. Ilunga said on the uh, uh, Rwanda or other countries. It, it, it's absolutely true that we have bad neighbors. And I think uh, what he mentioned is to see uh, this is an uncontrollable situation. Geographically, we cannot do anything about that because Rwanda is Rwanda, it's a neighbor. And we cannot change that geographic um, uh, pr prospect. And for that, I think what we have to do as Congolese is to now to have some kind of leadership which will transform those bad neighbors to become good neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so if we lack the capacity to transform the bad neighbors to become uh, good neighbors, we will we'll continue to face these serious problems, whatever, whatever the situation might be. So we cannot kick Rwanda 
or say because we have a bad neighbor, then let take it in, in another continent. It, it will not happen. So it's us now to take that responsibility to make sure that we have the capacity in the Congo to, uh, to, to have leaders who will transform this from negative to something positive. And, and the other second point will be, in, in we have this kind of illusion like somehow, um, you know, the international community of the United States, France, Belgium, will have the mandate to come and fix our problems. And, and they, they don't have that, the mandate to come and fix our problem. We, we should, as Congolese, take control and charge of our own country and then invite the people to, to come and help us. But we cannot expect you know, foreign countries to come and tell us what we should do while we have the ability to, to start working as Congolese and make progress ourselves and then we can get everybody else involved. But we have to start forgetting this notion that the United States has the mandate to come to the Congo and fix all the problems that we have. So that's my point. Thank you. The uh, lady at the back. Hi, Sanan Thari with the Friends of Congo. And my question has to do with political uh, practice and culture in relation to elections. Um, how do you, this is a problem in all of Africa, not only in the Congo, uh, the practice of zero-sum game. And most people feel that education and changing the mentality is going to help that. But we may not have time for that to completely change an entire political culture in a matter of months, maybe even years. So how do you propose that we address that within the maybe not the coming up elections, but maybe the next one to positively impact the political practice and culture in Congo? Okay, and the last question from Margot. Okay, and panel, in addition to these questions, we have quite a few from uh, online um, participants. Um, one, which I'll throw generally to the panel, is uh, that uh, it seems as if from your comments nothing is working in the DRC. And the, w the questioner wants to know if you can point to anything at all that is working in the, in, 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 in the, in the DRC. Uh, a second question for you, Jack, is that there's somebody here who was both a trainer and an elections monitor during the last elections and said, could you tell us where the fraud you mentioned happened because the person doesn't seem to know what you are talking about. Um, and then another one for you on the elections is that the voter registration process, um, how would you propose it gets improved? Um, Victor. Yes. Um, what role does the census have in economic development of the DRC? And do you see a role for ecotourism or tourism in um, improving the prospects? Um, one for um, you, um, Professor Tebeni, was that um, they liked your model, but um, how would you situate it in the context of economic realities in the DRC? And second, where has this worked before, and could you give examples? Um, there's one more which I'll throw to um, George at the end, is that... Uh, this whole discussion today is about responsive and accountable leadership. Um, based on what you've told us, um, how could responsive and accountable leadership work in the DRC? Because this person is a community organizer 
and uh, would like to know in practical terms uh, what this means. And um, there was somebody, a panelist mentioned um, the TR, having a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, a questioner says, um, why do you want a TRC in the Congo when we have Kinzonzi and Baraza in the Kivus that need to be strengthened instead? So that's quite a bit for you to um, tackle. And we have 15 minutes in which to do it. <laughs> so I'll ask for us to be as pointed and as um, focused as possible. And maybe we'll start closest to me and work our way down to George. Okay. Um, if I may answer the uh, first question from Maman, yes. Uh, thanks for uh, telling me about your son. <laughs> that is interesting. Um, I think the answer I can give you uh, is... is uh, basically a repeat of uh, our uh, friend and, 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 and brother over there. Um, I may not have been as clear as I would have wanted to. We've been skipping through this presentation very quickly due to time constraints. But what he said is exactly what I, I meant. In the long run, of course, we Congolese, we, we didn't deserve being invaded by Rwanda or, or Uganda or anybody. Okay, we didn't. That is very clear. But going forward, in, in, in trying to secure uh, Congo, Congo and, and, and the population, we're going to have to deal with all our neighbors and make sure we have good relations. But as I said, <coughs> in, in, in the slide that you saw, we have to be able to defend our country. That is a must. There's no getting around that. We must be able to defend our country. Because if you, if you think the time... Uh, the brief, or I don't know, for, for a period of time when Mobutu was in power, none of those countries could actually venture into the DRC because they knew there was a strong army there and nobody could venture in. Now, does that mean that we, we did not have good relations with Rwanda and Uganda? Quite the opposite, we did. We had good relations with them because, well, they kept their hands off. They knew that if, if they tried, they would be beaten off quite seriously. Now, we have to do that, but that doesn't mean to say that because we have to be strong and therefore we cannot have good relationship with our neighbors. But if, if we reverse that, we would have exactly the same situation, the opposite. The whole world will be crying out for Rwanda being persecuted by the DRC, which, you know, the world is still a bit sore about it, about the, the genocide in, in Rwanda. So if DRC became a very strong country today, and say, well, all right, it's now our turn, we're going to invade Rwanda, everybody will be up in arms, and say, well, why? So we're not going to make enemies, but we're going to make sure we are strong enough to defend ourselves if we need to. So that, that's really the answer. But at the same time, have good relationship with our, all, all our neighbors. Now, um, I don't know if there was any other question. I, I, I was particularly uh, looking into, somebody asked about the ecology, the uh, ecotourism. Eco um, well, I do believe that uh, ecotourism um, is, is a good thing. It, 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 it provides um, uh, uh, those working in industry with a job, but it's got to be controlled. It's got to be regulated. It can't be, a, you know, a kind of open to uh, any old thing. It's got to be controlled. It's got to be done in a way that is uh, less damaging to the environment. It's less exploitative to those working in, in, in the industry, uh, it, it's got to be regulated. So ecotourism, welcome, but it's got to be controlled and, and, and regulated properly. Thank you. Jack? <coughs> yeah, uh, I want to answer to the question of uh, a friend of Congo who asked about uh, the culture in, in our countries about elections. I know that there is no time for Congo now to really prepare that because education is really a long process, but people can start. And that's why I did propose that if the international community and the diaspora can come together and create a, com a committee of, uh, to start uh, dealing with that question, that could be a, a starting point. And if political parties can be also founded very well, 
they can be able to to raise to, to raise their issue and to to educate their, their population and even to, uh, to 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 carry out their activities very well because the problem is that most of political parties are, do not have money to do to to carry out their activities so uh, among those activities is information it's education also and we know that Congo is the most is one of the countries where the church can play a well ro a good role because churches <coughs> control at least 85 percent of the population so if we involve the churches also that can help also to start preparing for the education and for the changing of the of the culture but i know that that will take a long time because it's a process there is a i don't know if i'll answer the question there's a second question i don't want to talk about that where they ask if there is any uh, anything which is working very well in Congo. Mm -hmm. I really don't want to talk about that because I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I really don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> eh? okay. It's been, has been, uh, yeah. oh, 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 okay. The so, kind of well, the th then the problem is, yeah. where is it going? Mm -hmm. yeah. What role is it playing in the economy? Mm -hmm. That boulevard no. is connecting no industry to no. No. any marketplace. It, it's an isolated piece of tarmac, if you call it that way. You need, you need to recognize that it's been done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's been done. All right. Let's yeah, uh, it's a wrong priority. Let's go through uh, the, the, the webcast question, mm -hmm. where they asked about uh, where uh, ballot casts have been filled up. Mm -hmm. uh, we all remember that after the, f the first round of the presidential elections, there were seven <coughs> ele uh, election <coughs> election <coughs> commissioners or members of the election committees who were arrested because they did something which is which was wrong they did some fraud about the uh, elections that was said by the monique but we all know that, that according to the reports that we are having from our brothers and uh, cousins from the ground that the elections were not transparent i even gave you the quote from the Carter center which says that procedural flaws have, have shown that the elections were not very transparent. That's the answer I can give to that question. Voter registration, in fact, uh, I just, because of time, I did not talk about that. I believe that, well, today the voter registration, if we continue in the way it is done, it can take even two or three years because they don't have enough offices in enough local offices they have seven local offices in each region which is very small congo is a country which is well organized traditionally because we have traditional uh, traditional chiefs which are very well implanted in the country we have the churches as i said if the commission the election commission can use all those uh, infrastructures, they, they are able to go further in the local uh, villages and do the registration faster. And it takes now the competency of the member who are also in those uh, uh, offices to do that reg registration more efficiently. Those are the questions which were directed to my Thank you very much. Yes, um, there was a question on how to improve the um, Congolese economy. Um, <clears throat> as you know, there are conditions that are required, necessary conditions before you start any investment. And that's the role of any government, is to um, make sure that the necessary con the conditions are made. I'm talking about infrastructure, so communication and all of that. Uh, somebody asked what is, what is working well. I remember, uh, I don't know if they have still uh, maintained the road, but I think uh, Kinshasa and Matadi um, uh, highway uh, was well done, uh, that I can say, because it took us about five hours uh, to get from Kinshasa to Matadi. But once you get to Matadi, then, then the roads is, are not done inside the city, but they were done outside uh, by the World Bank. Uh, if they maintain it, I think that was a good thing to do. 
But at the same time, uh, those, are, those are not the roads that lead to where the uh, uh, production takes place. Uh, some people are asking uh, why we don't have enough um, food in the Congo, uh, because there is a lack of uh, uh, road that leads to the, where the farmers produce. Uh, if there is no road, then farmers will produce only what, what is needed for their subsistence, and they cannot think about the market. Uh, not only that, uh, the, the economy of the Congo uh, will take, um, you know, will, will be developed only uh, when the agricultural sector is developed. Uh, that, I believe that uh, 100%, uh, because that will um, actually uh, set people free from the agriculture into the um, service sector and industry. Uh, because if there is no anything to transform, uh, especially in the food uh, production to process, then uh, there will not be that uh, uh, export uh, of the agricultural uh, product. Not only that, uh, the government has to make sure that those farmers are well taken care of. Uh, here you have uh, government policies on how to uh, sustain the agricultural production, uh, which uh, employs only 3% of the, actually 2% of the U.S. population is in agriculture. But in our, in our structure, most of African countries, it's, it's about 70% of the population into agriculture. Until that sector is freed from uh, uh, most of the people living in rural areas, then uh, I don't see how our economy, except because our economy is based on mineral. And that's a wrong uh, assumption for the whole country to, uh, uh, just take into account only mineral part. And you remember what, what happened to copper uh, when in the 70s, when the uh, copper uh, value collapsed and the, our economy collapsed <coughs> again uh, with that production. Um, another thing that farmers are taxed, as we know, uh, they have to uh, pay tax more than uh, any other citizen in the Congo, and you have militaries uh, harassing them. Uh, because of the, what they do uh, in, their, in their production. So those things ha have to be taken care of by, by uh, the government. But and still, you still see uh, most small producers taking care of themselves. Um, there was a time where I had the opportunity to, to uh, visit uh, uh, the Bar Congo uh, and then also to, uh, to Katanga. Uh, where I saw small business in, in, in rural areas taking care of themselves because the government couldn't do anything. Uh, they had to take care uh, of their own and make sure that there is enough production. But that was not formal uh, economy. That's this dual uh, economy as we, we, we know it. Uh, there is a formal uh, taking place, and most of the people live in the formal rather than formal, uh, formal economy. Uh, there was a question on uh, decentralization. Uh, actually, the government is in the process of uh, implementing decentralization. My biggest fear is, are they empowering those local institutions to be, uh, you know, to sustain themselves? And that's my big concern. Uh, we see the production in, in uh, 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 Bujimai, for instance, with the, the diamond that is being produced there. You can visit the city, there is nothing there in terms of infrastructure. Everything is gone to Kinshasa. Uh, the same way, uh, I was uh, actually in my village in Chikapa where people are asking me to build a road. Uh, how, how, what authority I have to build a road in Chikapa? And I don't even have the means to do it. Uh, <laughs> but because uh, I gave um, a seminar at the USP uh, to tell them how they should not focus their economy based on mineral, diamond. And you see kids not going to school, all generations lost. Uh, young girls don't even talk about young girls. They don't even think about school. They just about think about having babies, getting married by those uh, trafficking uh, of diamond. And uh, so, and then there is no hope for, for them. And even uh, young men, uh, they are not going to school anymore. So. Uh, this is the fear that the government has to put more um, resource so that those decentralized entities uh, will be self-sustaining. And I don't see that really uh, coming to fruition. There was a question on diaspora supporting the um, uh, political opposition uh, in the Congo. 
we know that there is no opposition now. Uh, there was a time when Bemba was trying to face the uh, current government, but since he left, uh, we don't see really the opposition uh, being organized. Uh, we would like to see that happen. How diaspora is going to do that, I mean, that's uh, up to us to uh, discuss that in another forum. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission, the reason why I say that is that uh, we need to bring to justice those who have been involved, and there is impunity, and that's the tradition, that's the culture in the Congo. We want to see that happen, and we are asking the question here to the uh, assistant uh, deputy, uh, uh, assistant uh, secretary of the state, and she mentioned that uh, the country has to petition. But who is in the country is going to petition? Because I don't see leadership, as we said, that is going to bring that to uh, to the uh, um, international uh, court. So. I think the, the diaspora, I don't know if we can petition that. Maybe that's the thing that we need to discuss and see how, how we can uh, uh, coordinate that. You have to do that. Thank you. Okay, final yes. brief comment from... Uh, yes, uh, just briefly on uh, the two questions asked me and on the question of neighbors. Uh, the first question was about uh, leadership in the army and uh, the statement made by uh, Foreign Minister and Tambo Mamba that uh, there are nine foreign generals in our army, if Ntambu Mamba knows that, why is he in the government? Uh, he had to resign and protest that, uh, but he's still benefiting from that government. This is a problem. We don't have moral courage on the part of political leaders in the Congo to take a stand because everybody's looking up after their own interests. Uh, everybody wants to be in government and to benefit from the government rather than to, to uh, organize the people for a real democratic uh, dispensation in the Congo. Uh, that brings me to the, the, uh, the other question, which uh, relates to um, uh, to Ben's uh, uh, comments on centralization. I was associated to the discussion uh, of the first um, uh, bill that the Minister of Interior prepared in 2007 on to how to implement the constitutional provision on centralization. When you read that bill, there is no no real centralization being prepared by the government. Uh, the government is, is basically doing what the uh, specialists call the deconcentration rather than decentralization. Now there is no devolution of power <coughs> to local authorities. The government wants to control everything. So if that is the question, if that is the outcome, then there is no decentralization. And for us to have really responsible, accountable leaders, they have to be democratically elected. And we have to change our constitution in a way elections are held. For example, in the last elections, many people who failed to win seats as members of the National Assembly end up being elected provincial governors and senators, sure. while all they needed to do was to, to bribe members of provincial assemblies to elect them, because the governors and, and senators are elected by provincial assemblies. Mm -hmm. So you have a peacekeeping functions in Burundi in 1972. Uh, the genocide of 1972 in Burundi would have gotten out of hand had the Congolese paratroopers not intervened and established peace. We were able to intervene in Chad in 1981, mm. and alongside of Nigeria played a stabilizing role in, in that country. So this is what a country like ours is called upon. We are the biggest, the, the, the richest, and the most populous country in Central Africa. We have a vocation to help maintain peace and bring about prosperity for the entire region of Central Africa. So Rwanda and Uganda would be no threat to us if we had a strong government, if we had an organized government. We, can't, we, sh we shouldn't fear them. All we need to do is put our own house in order. Once that is done, everything else will be fine. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you very much, and um, thank you to the panel, and thank you to both panels. Um, we've had a very um, wide-ranging discussion I think we focused on a number of practical recommendations, and we've um, been able to ask a number of uh, probing questions. Um, one of the things that we're going to do in the coming weeks is, or uh, maybe coming, coming months, is to put all of these um, presentations together in a publication so that it's something that we would be able to have in both English and French, 
that would help inform us about what the thinking of the um, diaspora is in this particular context. And um, I'd really like to thank you all for your involvement. I'd like to recognize in particular um, George Alula, Kitenge Mbawa, and Nita Mbele, who couldn't be with us today because I think she delivered a baby last week. And uh, con congratulations to her. But they were very instrumental in um, getting this organized and getting the panelists and helping um, shape the entire um, event. Also like to thank uh, Michelle and Margot for their excellent job, for ex excellent work they've done with logistics. And uh, Matt Pearson for his uh, tireless efforts banging the keyboard. And you wouldn't be aware of it, but the red tie is in your honor. He doesn't always wear a red tie. So <laughs> And um, I look forward to um, continuing this discussion. I thank you all. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Doctor, as always, yeah, it's very important for us as the Congolese to say thank you to the USIT. Thank you for your arm involvement, uh, Ambassador Taylor, Michelle. Thank you for everything you have been doing to bring us just to play what we did today. And uh, on behalf of all the Congolese, being on the web or back home, just thank you. Uh, keep on moving forward to bring peace in our country.